since it kind of went down this realm of being a vehicle to sell products and people only doing it because this is how they're going to make money. It mm-hmm. just confuses me because mm-hmm. this was never about that. The, 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 the price was the experience of just doing it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That was why it was worth doing. Yeah. And, and, and also props, you know what I mean? If you're good at what you do, if you've taken out a few people in a battle, you know, if you've shown and killed a cipher, you know, that's currency, mm-hmm. you get me? Killer Killer Podcast Killer Killer Official Dot <laughs> You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Oh, here we go again. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be. If you're anywhere else, you're in trouble. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, Hoddle Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout. That's some NFT business for you. Big shout out to all the originals. Big shout out to everybody that's following us, keeping in touch, staying locked on and uh, passing the, the message around. If you haven't got the uh, Kellervision app, you are in trouble. Because that is the source for all of your mixes, your mini docs, full docs, uh, products, and of course, the notorious podcast that uh, just keeps on going and going and going. And on that note, oh my goodness, we're in for a rate treat. We have a friend of mine, which has been, well, he's certainly been a part of my uh, cultural DNA since the very beginnings. It was not for this man being on some of my more beloved, historically referenced podcasts. Uh, documentaries such as the South Bank show in the early early teens of mine uh, seeing him rap seeing him be part of the theatrical world being a part of the breaking world this is a b-boy right here well, and and an unsung hero in, in my books from apricot jam through to lyrical theater he's been ever pushing the boundaries and how far you can take hip-hop um, from covent garden in the 80s to now uh, the breaking convention ceo man of the moment man with the plan this is john zd <laughs> That was an amazing big up. I had to <laughs> accept that graciously. <laughs> My guy. And I was just saying as you came in, I was like, there's certain meters that I like to push when I know I'm in the right course. And having you sitting here is a bonus for me, man. How you been? I'm really good. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I've been following the podcast a little bit and I've seen certain heads on there mm. and it feels good to be part of that, mm. you know? Because mm. um, generally, I feel that... It's interesting that you said unsung. Um, I feel as though I'm not commercial. I'm a bit under, but I'm not even quite underground because I guess we've created different pathways. You mm. know what I mean? Mm. Pathways, you most definitely did. I think it felt to me like you'd seen an, an area, a gap, a thing, and I know that was unintentional i think your natural course is to try different things and put it put hip-hop in contexts and worlds way before such and such i might add way before all of the other sponsors and everything you were definitely doing it and creating these new lanes of discovery for people weren't you? Well, well i think it's a lot to do with what how i've embraced hip-hop generally um i come from a time period where i think hip-hop was about being as original as possible, you know Mm. what I mean? Um, A a time period where only you had that sound, or only you dressed in that way, Mm. do you know what I mean? Mm. It wasn't necessarily about starting whole trends, but for me, it was about standing out Mm. with your own shit, you know Mm. what I mean? Um, So a lot of the ideas I had, particularly when it comes to event promotion, was me having an idea and wanting to share it with many people, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I guess the Apricot Jam thing came about as a result of wanting to work with a live band that plays hip-hop, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, let's, talk, let's talk about Apricot Jam yeah. for a minute because we, we don't want to run up because we, we do have a lot of history with you. So let's, for, let's for, for, for a point of reference, let's get into Apricot Jam. Tell Absolutely. us about Apricot Jam. So Apricot Jam... Um, it came out of a time where um, amazing events like Flavor of the Month, just want to big up Flavor of the Month. 279, the original big up. Oh. 
open mic scenario, and, and I remember going yeah. there. And, and back on again. It's, it's returned, black on again, yeah. 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 It's, um, black on again. Um, yeah, this February. Don't miss it. Yes. Hopefully this comes out before that. Yeah, it's AP. Um, but yeah, man, um, I remember it was quite gladiatorial, mm. the open Ooh, mic. Is it yeah. gladiatorial? <laughs> yeah, the octagon's real. It was intense, <laughs> yeah. And an MC like me, I was shook in them contexts. Let's just keep it real, yeah? <laughs> and I remember going there thinking, there were certain MCs that step up and they'll rhyme for like four or five bars. And if you bounce your lyric or if you do something off key, bam, immediately, boom, yeah? It was hard Ruthless. Yeah. Um, and I always imagined a space in which it didn't feel that your head was going to the gallows, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So that was part of the Apricot Jam thing. It was having an open mic and it was about um, different levels of applause, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, also having spoken word in the place, do you know what I mean? That encouraged more women to go. Because mm-hmm. you remember back then it was like a sausage fest That's at right. certain hip-hop jams. Man United. Bear man, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, so it was really nice to have a bit more balance mm-hmm. from that point of view. Um, and also, the infamous bring your beat section. Oh. Yeah, where you would step up as an MC and instead of complaining about, oh, that rhythm's not the rhythm I want to rap on or this, that and the other, which people used to do a lot back in the day. Mm-hmm. Not so much now. But um, yeah, bring your own beat. So you actually do a beatbox to the band. And it's let me just pick up the original Apricot Jam band, you know what I mean? Richard, Wiley, Cat, Cassell, Ooh. Anthony Tidd, original bass player. These were high-end. Um, I mean, proper Amazing. high-end, you know what I mean? James, Jason Yard, and his brother James would play every now and again, but Jason Yard um, and Eric Apapule, yeah? These Ooh. were the originals for the Apricot Jam, yeah? And they were so dope that they could just quantize the beats that you're trying to send them, you know what I mean? Mm Because obviously we might not be in tune, this, that and the other. But, you know, it was just like how a computer would quantize your sound. That's what the band would do, you know what I mean? Mm. And then you'd spit, you know? But we had many brilliant MCs come through. We had Black Twang, um... Oh, man, we had Scientists of Sound back in the day. Scientists of Sound. Um... (sighs) We had, oh man, we had Bassmatic, man, Bassine, rest in peace. At this point, definitely Google all of this because this is some serious intel. Yeah, man. MC Mello. Oh, oh, and that's the, now, this is a name which I, for me anyway, for for discovering a UK sound, vocalists, you and Mello were the figureheads on, like I said, prior introduction. The South Bank Show, hip hop. Mm. South Bank Show was an ITV show <laughs> back in the uh, early to mid nineties, and yeah. one of the last. You know, I saw Iggy Pop on there, and that was just incredible. And then all of a sudden, this hip hop thing came. These were like, you know, pit pillars of like my. I was just all in. Yeah. By the time I heard you guys, and you were batting back and forth, I think you were on the tube outside the tube station. So I can't even remember yeah. it was, but like, for me, it was like, oh, these are the guys. Yeah. These are the, the these are the meters. These wow. are the how high you take it. So yeah, mellow. I should have me, put some records out. I should have done it. Uh, you made you made <laughs> mad lanes. You made mad lanes. So apricot jam was really was that was that one of your first kind of uh, life regular nights. It was. It right. was. It, it comes as a result of um, um, DJ Pogo basically. Uh-huh. Um, and big up Pogo he, big up Pogo all day yeah. he's in Brazil right now lucky yeah. man yeah. Um, but yeah man um, and he put me on um, with this company that was running the space and they said yeah Johnson should have a night so I had a night programmed it and um, yeah it was just a really creative venture you mm. know what I mean um, lost loads of money doing it, but mm. hey, who cares? <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. That's part of the course, right? That's part of the course. <laughs> um, but what I did learn about it is how to have fun. How to do an event that's hip-hop, that is fun, that's open, and that's welcoming. You mm. know what I mean? Um, I've always looked at the more positive points of hip-hop before the whole negative kind of gangster elements mm. became popularised. You know what I mean, mm. I remember, you know, in 1983, it really wasn't about that. It was mm. just about creativity, youthfulness, um, and this holistic 
vision of hip hop with the graffiti, the, the turntables. Holistic, the yeah. Holistic, you know I mean? yes. It was all one thing. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. Um, but yeah, since it kind of went down this realm of being a vehicle to sell products and people only doing it because this is how they're going to make money, it mm-hmm. just confuses me. Because mm-hmm. this was never about that. The, 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 the price was the experience of just doing it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That was why it was worth doing. Yeah. And, and, and also props. You know what I mean? If you're good at what you do, if you've taken out a few people in a battle, you know, if you've shown and killed a cipher, you know, that's currency. Mm-hmm. You get me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think the street culture stops right here. The buck is here. The buck's in the building. All right. So, <laughs> so this, this is these parameters in which you create your art you're right there's there's there became this uh interest of currency like what value are you getting why are you doing it if you're not getting paid but this was a and still can be found of a time where it was it, 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 you would you, unbeknownst to you you were delivering teachings and basically showing people roadmaps like john z you you were up there Doing something like Apricot Jam of its time, I, I can't think of anything that's been matched by it. I really can't. You know, this was... It, of course, it happens in, in you know, dribs and drabs, mm. but we're talking about something that was so regular mm. and made such impact and introduced the likes of me to the Mellows and Black Twangs and, mm. you know, Scientists of Sounds, you know, Big Up Our Kill, you know, mm. they, who all orbited around here in the, in the North Weezy as well. So, nice. you know, this is... It's, just, it's, it's fundamental that people get the idea and understanding that you can't just... You have to have skills. Mm. This is this is not a spectator sport. That's right. That's right. right? That's right. Um, I remember um, when Skinny Man he smashed it down there um, with Mud Fam. Mm-hmm. I think it was um, um, yeah, it was the two the two icons. Well, they're two icons for me anyway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Chester P and Mongo. You know what I mean? <sighs> um, <sighs> But them three and they did an apricot jam, absolutely killed it. Big up Skinny Man all yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And Mongo, big up Mongo and Chester. Mongo, all of them, all of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, um, I think for me, it, it really was about pulling together a couple of different scenes that I was on at the time because I was on the spoken word scene as well. Mm-hmm. So I was really enjoying this other way of looking at words and telling stories and it not necessarily bound by the bars of the beat, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and my style was definitely a cappella worthy, mm. you know what I mean? It was, it would flow all over the place, you know what I mean? Stretching Sometimes. the vocal boundaries, st- stretching the, what was the, the rigidness of yes, rap. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I was influenced, you know, by people like Freestyle Fellowship, back in the day, who would use their voices like instruments, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because they just roll into a, roll into a, a almost like jazzy, like yeah. roll into some notes and tunes yeah. and flip it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big up Micah Nine all day, mm. that dude. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I think also for me, yeah, there was a, a real creative aspect of the form that I was more interested in at the time. There was this early 90s vibe which there was a lot of one could say left field hip hop mm-hmm. that people were looking at. You know Give some I mean? examples um, of that. Okay, so for me, Freestyle Fellowship is a very sure. good example of that. Um, Safir. Oh, um, you said Safir. Yeah, Hell yeah. Definitely. These were West Coast Dons. Yes, yes. Casual. Casual, yes. Um, High Rose. And that big battle between High Rose and Hobo Junction, mm. basically. Hobo Junction. Sick battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was into that. Mm. Um, uh, I guess the East Coast stuff, yeah, I mean, you can't front on just proper straight up bars. Mm-hmm, you know I mean, people mm-hmm. like Tragedy back in the day, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, KRS One, yeah, yeah, Rakim, yeah. yeah, yeah. these yeah, yeah. classic level MCs, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, people like MC Mello, I put them up in that category. Do you know what I mean? 100%. Um, Farside also took the, yeah. the, the, the jazz flow and really flipped it, made it more. Um, made it more uh, 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 pliable to like albums and mm. that that four way dynamic of just each one was a different character. Yeah, man, I love that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that was amazing. And you know, I, I'll, I'll definitely put leaders of the new school mm. um, when they first come out. Obviously, Buster blew up out of that, but mm. as a crew, 
I've, I've always thought they were sick. You know Ahead I mean? of their time. You know? Yeah, yeah. I always thought Charlie Brown was the one that was going to blow up. Me too. He just um, disappeared, didn't he? Mm, yeah. Um, I remember I was in, the last time I was in New York, I was at a party and I bucked up on Dinko D, which was some classic <laughs> old school stuff. Yeah. You know, I was like, Dinko D! He was probably like, hey, cool, man, chill. <laughs> yeah, he actually totally. did say that. <laughs> they don't actually realise, I mean, a lot of our heroes, you know, you don't know how much they actually impact on you, but but for what they were doing at their time, you know, in my mind anyway, they're heralded as some of the, yeah, they really broke the boundaries. When you listen to a LONS album, um, Lisa New School, you know, you really are in for a treat. You know, you just yeah. put it on, that's where you've got to listen to an album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you ain't heard LONS, then it's worth going back, you know? Yeah, for sure. It is really interesting going back, you know, mm. to that period of time in the, the late 90s, mm. early 80s, just turning into late 90s. There was some really interesting stuff. You know, just stuff like um, Special Ed, mm. um, I Got It Made. I yeah. absolutely loved that joy. It never gets boring. You know those tunes that always sound dope, mm. yeah? If you ain't heard it, check it out. I got it made special ed. Absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and yeah, I guess obviously my age, I feel sometimes like a, a whiny old man when I talk about back in the day, yeah? And okay, let's not go with it, yeah? But let me just talk about back in the day, yeah? Do it. Um, Do it. In the Apricot Jam times, the amount of... MCs that was doing some really interesting stuff. And I think it was because the identity of Apricot Jam was you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? When mm -hmm. you step up on the stage, then you just make it yours. You know mm -hmm. what I mean, I think Apricot Jam had a, a very welcoming energy. Anybody that went, write down in the comments how it was for you, the mm -hmm. Apricot Jam experience. Oh, was, yeah, super important. Yeah, it was really, really dope. You're right, because it's almost, at, at, at its time, there really wasn't, like, nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, you know, for grime artists especially, you can't, <laughs> you, of course you can fill the mini rooms and the, you know, the halls and the 60 capacity sweat boxes, but, you know, it's really, it's really from record straight to arena now. Mm. But when you had the Apricot Jam, like you say, you had this moment where you had almost had like mini headlines mm. where people were able to conduct and bring their own, you know, that that's some top end shit, isn't yeah, it? Man. Yeah, man, it really was. It really was. And, and just to see the way MCs would work the band, because the band was really there for them, mm. do you know what I mean? And they really wanted to make them look and sound as dope as possible, mm. you know what I mean? Um, you know, the band would come down in volume to mm. allow the MC to hear the enunciation of his mm. spitting. And then obviously the chorus comes in and then yeah. it'll pick up, you know? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, there was it was a very sensitive band from that point of view um, and would really listen to the MC, you know what I mean? Mm. Um yeah, man. You know what? Talking about it, I'm, I'm, I'm. Go on, say really it. Say it. it say it. No, say no, it. No, I'm not going to say it's going to I mean, there's been a couple of times where we have come back. Mm. Um, I, I had, I brought Apricot Jam back for my 40th birthday party. Awesome. A few years. Yeah, that's back. right. Jeez, um, like... But um, yeah, and we brought it back. It was a great fun, and but people criticised the party, saying, "Johnsy, you was on stage for too long." Yeah, Fucking with the birthday, band. Bad. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I keep saying to people. Yeah, understand. It's my party and I rinse the mic if I want to. <laughs> yeah, That's it. That's it. It's fucking John Zee Dees. Get the fuck out of here. Um, brother. And the, the, the other beauty of John Zee's is your, is your um, transitional, the way in which you can, uh, like a butterfly, float into these different arenas. The amount of times I've, you know, seen an article in you know time out of the john z and and something more bespoke one hit shows that you you know you just curated or coordinated or a part of behind the scenes mm. you know you, you you you're you're constantly striving to push the message across different areas of 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 the entertainment world yeah yeah and and particularly i mean obviously there's um, the theatre thing, yeah. um, which happened in the mid-90s, just as I left 
London Contemporary Dance School, mm-hmm. um, which I used to keep on the low about. You know what I mean, at the time, you know, I wasn't sure about shit. You know, I'm doing classical ballet during the day and rhyming with MCs at night, and you know, what an and amazing stuff. balance, and, <gasps> dude. It was it was really strange, and then every now and again that crossover would happen and just shock everyone for a little while. I remember. Um, I brought my brethren to dance school once <laughs> and they were like, John Z. Okay, so basically what happened is I got rushed by these girls. It was all really touchy-feely kind of thing at the time, you know what I mean? As one does, you understand. Um, when you're John Z, carry on. And got rushed. <laughs> and they were like, John Z, that's, that's a bit, ooh, what's going on? Like, I goes, what do you mean, ooh? We're just friends. And they were like, nah, man, that didn't look friendly to me. So they got caught up in in this thing as well. And there was one dude <laughs> who I saw, uh, one of my gay friends, mm-hmm. yeah? And I bucked up on him and my brethren was there and he comes up to me, oh, Josie, mm, like that. <laughs> and you know how them man's car can be from road and all that. Yeah, yeah, I mean? this so is two worlds like... colliding. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the conduit. You are watching this happen before your eyes. The thing you didn't want happening is completely <laughs> happening. <laughs> but, you know, look at where we are now. Yes, you yeah. know, we're good now. You so know? Right. The notor- notoriety, really, <laughs> let's be honest, you know. These these are folklore stories that, yeah, you know, only on podcasts you get a chance to really express and explain the scenario. Yeah. <laughs> but that sounds like Beatlemania to me, man. That well, sounds like... I mean, it was it was great. I mean, the the contemporary dance experience was was amazing because it was contemporary dance that got me to New York the first time I went. Right. To New York. Okay. Um, I was doing a I was doing something. Uh, what was it called? A Jacob's Pillow in Massachusetts, Boston. Ooh. Um, this really rustic community with barns where dance happened, contemporary dance. And I was there working on a project for two weeks. Ended up with a piece that got performed out there as well. Wow. So for me, it was contemporary dance that got me to the birthplace of hip-hop. You know what I mean? Um, wow. And But equally, um, I remember connecting with an MC called Sharky. Um, that was her name. She goes by the name... Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, she goes by the name of Hanifa now. But um, she's from Yonkers. But mm-hmm. she was working on this project at the time in the early 90s using this thing called a website. And I was like, what, what's a website? This is pre all of that mm-hmm. internet business, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And she invited me to the launch of her guillotine internet party. Guillotine because it was for the heads. And Oh my God, that is I, awesome. What a it's, great... It's a dope, dope, yeah, dope name. But yeah, she was one of the first I ever heard to do it. Um, but the executioners were at this party. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and I was spitting. This is the first show that I did in New York. So it was like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but no, nah, I killed Rob it. Swift, Rock Raider. Rock Raider. Total Rest Eclipse. in peace. Oh, yeah, rest in peace, of course. Like all the gang, they yeah, were all there. Every single one of them, oh, man. Oh, my God. It was, a, yeah, it was a remarkable event. Were they making the music while... You guys, or were they the house DJs sort of thing? Um, they were the house DJs, but they did sets. Do you know what I mean? So wow. you see them do the round robin, do you know what I mean? And oh, all man. the OG things, but as a crew. Just to put it in context, that became a lot of money in their heyday of DMCs and ITFs. Like, that sounds to me like they were just trying things out. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. You were there? Yeah, man. That's incredible. Dude, it was, it was amazing. This That must have been like 90... Four, maybe 93, 94, but it was proper early 90s. Right? Wow. Um, this is around a time when Raucous was just about to come. No, it was before that. It was before that. Um, as I said, it was around a time when people first started making internet yeah. sites. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So the theatre thing came as a result of a collision. One, because the music side of rap was, I was proper disillusioned with it because I felt it going down this gangster route Mm -hmm. where it felt like to gain legitimacy, you had to prove how many people you've killed Mm. and refer to um, selling drugs. But all of these things that, for me, uh, 
I guess they're things that naughty children do. Yeah, do you know yeah. What I mean? As as uh, <laughs> as uh, penned by OC Times Up, you know, right. right? It was you know there was this fraction of you know a lot of the DICTCs of the world and what they were trying that they were promoting music to get out of that situation, yeah. right? Yeah. But then there was this yeah there was this ever pressing industry that was pushing yeah. through you know the bands and acts we know and love now. But at the, at the time it was like totally you know. It's fragmented, wasn't it? It really was derailing. Dude. It really was, and for me, it was it was obvious to see that happening. You know, because mm. um, I remember how powerful Public Enemy, their position was, and the mm. power of their voice, mm. and it was almost like that's where things kind of switched. You know, once Professor Griff got mm. blamed for anti-Semitism, and then the Public Enemy just split up. Mm. Um, yeah, and things just went really weird. But simultaneously, you've got NWA that are just starting to get big and blow up and stuff. And I'm thinking, if you're talking about anti-anything, their name is Niggers With Attitude. And for me, the introduction of that word mm. into just normal language, I remember that yeah, yeah. shift as well. Yeah, yeah. I remember it was something that was, you know, what American comics might use. Yeah. Um, but to see that become translated into regular language, yeah. you know, I just remember thinking, "Oh, do I join in to this?" Well, this is the problem because I, I get it. Like, there's there's a there's an ownership to the word, but at the same time, it plays in the hands of the BBC, man. Just you know, where they'll censor word like motherfucker shit, but they don't they don't censor that. Yeah. What the fuck's that about? Yeah. It's almost bec- it, psychologically. It became the norm. Yes, 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 yes. And everyone was like green lighting it, and it's yeah. like, nah, man, like that. That shouldn't be part of the. Yeah. As a lyricist, you yeah. you, you must have definitely recognised that. Yeah, I, I blatantly recognised that, and it was around that point I just said, okay, um, this isn't for me. I didn't even want to try <clears> and compete <throat> in that lane. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Simultaneously, contemporary dance is looking proper weird, yeah? <laughs> People are just doing some weird shit and I get the idea of searching for new ways of whatever, whatever, but more time I'm seeing people just bombarding us with your weird issues and you're basically wanking off in front of us mm. and calling it art, yeah? yeah? Not literally, but figuratively, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And for me, I just thought, no, nah, I don't know if I want to be part of this way of doing contemporary dance. Mm-hmm. I was also never into the commercial shit anyway, mm-hmm. just generally as an artist. So I, I wasn't looking to bring the dance in that way. So I found my own lane. Mm-hmm. And it came as a result of being frustrated with all of the existing spaces to express, mm. you know what I mean? Um and I just thought, yeah, let's just fuse these things. Let's fuse the hip-hop. Let's, let's not be running away from the contemporary dance, you know mm. what I mean? Um, and, yeah, and it felt like a really comfortable place for me as an artist to sit, you mm-hmm. know? But equally, so so at that time I made a couple of pieces, Aeroplane Man. Mm-hmm. Um, yes! What? Did you see that? Did you no, ever see I, it? No, but this is what I remember in Time Out and things like this. Yeah. Like, these pocket events that you were doing and it's yeah. like, dude, that's crazy. Like, yeah. I think I even did a gig with you as one of your events as well, wasn't it? I, that, I can't seem to remember. What I do remember is bringing you and Reveal. Reveal, big up Reveal. Yeah. Poisonous Poets. Poisonous Poet. Big up Doc bringing Brown. you guys. Loki. Loki, all of that oh, crew. Yeah. <laughs> See what they're all doing now, right? <laughs> yeah. Man's on Star Wars, right? yeah, Doc yeah. Brown, I see him on Star Wars, that was it. Yeah. I was just like, you have hit a particular level. Echelon of fucking of, cool. Of just cool, dude. Yeah. Like, big up Doc Brown. Yeah, okay. Big up Reveal, big yeah. up all of them. Um, Tony D, yeah. what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So, yeah, I'm very impressed by them, man. But, um, but yeah, I remember me, you and Reveal going to the South Bank. Mm, that's and it. And there was something happening near that I was on the panel of and I brought used to with me. That's right. To talk about hip hop, I guess. Yeah, something like that. It wasn't the first time we'd, you know, connected, but I do remember, mm. again, it just fell in the timeline of all the different, you know, oh, you're doing that? Well, I'm doing this. Poof, that's Johnsy. You're doing that? I'm doing this. Does that ever. 
tread carefully here because I suffer for the same fate. Mm. What what is immediate now in the commercial world becomes future nostalgia. And we all like a bit of comfort if that's concerned. But at the time, you know, I'm definitely non conforming when it comes to commerciality and things have to have a, a level of integrity to it that doesn't that isn't whip cracked by anything behind the scenes. Mm. Does that does that become a hindrance? Is it a challenge for you? Well being so integrity minded and thinking outside the box and pushing forward in areas where you wouldn't normally just because it's or they wouldn't normally rather well firstly i I was thinking about my my life and i've always been in theater do you know what i mean Mm. um and i think that this voice that i've been pushing in the theater it's because it's always been there in me Mm -hmm. i've always been doing theater Mm -hmm. i've always been hip-hop as long as i can remember Mm -hmm. Obviously, theatre come before hip hop, actually. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, and and because I'm in it, that's what I'd like to express. You know what I mean? Um, and I didn't even. I'm doing this as though it, for it to be massive. Yes, if you're not it if wasn't. you're not watching and listening, these hands are <laughs> expressing seismic. You know, that's it. You know, um, it wasn't meant to. I didn't imagine it getting big. I just imagined it being this is my little USP mm-hmm. in how I do theatre. And when I realise that it's not, it's actually a way that anyone can do theatre, then it just clicked for me. And then that became my whole journey, which is to make sure hip-hop is a theatrical thing. Do you know what I mean? That we can use hip-hop to make theatre. We can use hip-hop dance for the movement. We can use text from MCs. We can use music from producers, beatbox, to create any kind of soundscape you want. Um, and, yeah, and graffiti mm. as as art. I remember I did a piece. Um, oh, not many people, not many people know mm. this. Exclusive. I, I did a piece um, called Tag. Uh, maybe some people have seen it. Tag, just right in my name. And it's a piece which is a story of a graffiti artist um, talking about why he became a graffiti artist and a battle he'd gone to. Very simple story. But the story was told with four massive graffiti sculptures as you walk into the building, yeah? Mm. And you can barely see what it says, but it does say order, five letters. And um, as the piece starts, it goes dark really quickly and you hear um, tss, tss, spraying. And um, all of a sudden, yeah, these dogs running, coming in and running. So it's like this guy got caught spraying. <laughs> and then slowly the lights come up to show the same space again. But as you look closely, it starts to drip. And the drips are the dancers that are wearing colour coordinated stuff. So they're camouflaged into the painting so when they drip you, you can really see it moving and, oh. and, and, the, and the music's this slow string that comes up that was done by DJ Pogo um, but yeah um, and I, I, I created this piece with these amazing dancers and a great spoken word artist called John Berkovich he, he, spells, yeah. Yeah. Um, and some amazing dancers B-Boy Little Tim was in that B-Boy Kofi was in that um, Katie P was in that guy called Halil, mm. um, German b boy, mm-hmm. um, and a, a, a dancer called Tommy Franz, and he's all over Britain's Got Talent yeah. and stuff. Not so much Britain's Got Talent, and strictly come dancing. He, he's a choreographer there. But, um, but yeah, basically, that show was some amazing doo doo, and I think I might have to bring it back actually. Bring that ship. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, I might have to bring where's it back. Where's it come from, John? Where's this? Do you, you just sit there, you know, just thinking, waiting for the universe to like pop these ideas into your head? Like this isn't normal thought behaviour, right? This is crazy. Well, well, for me, it is. It. I think it comes from the most exciting times that I had when studying. Mm. Yeah, choreography classes. I absolutely love just sitting down and thinking of concepts and reasons Mm. to make movement, do you know what I mean? So because there's that and then there's this 
wonderful, undefinable thing that's happening in street culture mm. with dance and different dance forms constantly happening and shifting yeah. and 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 becoming professional and becoming technically very distinct. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And and all of this is just great food to now make theatre, you know? And f- theatre should be free. Like, I remember you saying at the top here, and it's something we've talked about before, like the whole idea of regimented with rap. Rap is this and we do it like this. You know, the, the flock will always lean towards the thing that probably sells the most or the thing that will get the, you know, the, great, the, the greatest, uh, you know, chin scratch. Yeah. But when you really challenge that, status quo and you say to yourself no 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 this should be free we should be allowed to be creative yeah. do you think um economically do you think that in the times of struggle that maybe we all are in in one form or another with the rise of the internet and mm. inflation going up energy prices particularly big up all my international crew but we're talking very localized here in, in the uk but it serves everywhere do you mm. think that's the perfect point to be mm. being doubling down and being super creative well I think it's a natural consequence. Do you know what I mean? Um, once the going gets tough and once you're put into a corner, um, you're either going to fight or you're going to make art. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To fight, you know? Um, you're going to need a weapon, you know what I mean? And and some people's weapons is their tongue, some people's is their, their, their fingers and their art, um, some is their body, you know? Um but one thing I would say is that, for sure, hip-hop culture can run with this, yeah? Because it come from this, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It come from a lack of resources creating tension, which is then eased by creativity, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think that what we learned and what we're learning still through hip-hop should guide us through this time, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, Because obviously there's the mainstream media image of hip-hop and what it's doing. And then there's the real Mm -hmm. image of hip-hop and what it's doing around the world for communities all over the place. And I mean, we know hip-hop's doing some really positive things. And now that we're entering this um, economic crisis, Mm -hmm. we're going to need some of these values to help us get through this. Big time. You mentioned people in different areas of the world that are all suffering in different ways. I mean, Brazil, I mean, Brazil with their graffiti and their hip hop, they, they really have the fundamentals down, don't they? Because yeah. again, I can understand why Pogo has, has, I mean, he must be overworked. Like yeah. the, the, the way the culture's embraced over there. Yeah. And then you get the opposite side of the spectrum with breaking and, you know, you get South Korea that, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, Russia and, um, you know, even uh, early doors like Germany and France mm-hmm. were absolutely killing it. Yeah. But France is predatorial when it comes to their breaking. They don't right, right. fuck about, yeah. <laughs> you know. They keep these foundations really yeah. pure, don't they? Yeah, they really do. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's deep, you know, because culturally speaking, um, there is a facet and particularly in this country, England, where things go through fad, Mm. yeah? And they're not really sat into as culture, do you know what I mean? And I think to a certain extent, breaking has suffered from that, Mm. um, in London in particular, not so much around the country, particularly up north. Mm -hmm. I just want to big up Newcastle about now for Just Jam, which is going to be at the end of the month. I'm going to be at Just Jam. Check out Just Jam if you don't know Just Jam. Check that out. And also, failing to mention, Blackpool is is going to be another hotspot for you and and the convention and all the, you know, all the, the offshoots, the octopus arms in yes. which you've, you're curating and getting involved in. Okay, yeah, I've got to talk about that. Breaking That's Convention it. this year, the 20-year anniversary of Breaking Convention. Uh-huh. Um, we started in 2004, and we've pretty much maintained the same values, which is um, the best hip-hop from around the world and around the corner. Mm-hmm. Sorry, the best hip-hop theatre from around the world and around the corner, you know what I mean? All aspects covered. Big up Baps, who did the piece on, on the last convention, right? right. Walks into that place, like, boom, yeah. <laughs> yo, there's B. Yeah. Old tight. There's a lot of really good graffiti. We've had 
amazing writers from around the world mm. over the years. I'm not sure who's coming up this year, but they will be dope. That's mm. all that matters. Mm-hmm. Um, Big up Letty, who I work with, who hooks up all of these amazing writers because he's got lots of friends in the writing world. Big up Letty all day. That's what we need. That's it. Um, so, 20-year anniversary. We we start at Sadler's Wells Theatre and every three years or so we'll do a national tour. So we're definitely doing a national tour this year. But what's different about this year for London is that we're doing breaking convention in different venues up until the main event at Sadler's Wells. So we're going to start doing a choreo poetry session at the Yard Theatre. It's a collaboration between poets and choreographers. Yeah. So we're going to see how poets and dancers create stuff together. I don't know what's going to happen, but the work is going to be made in two weeks leading up to the event. But we've got some really interesting artists involved. Don't want to mention them yet because they haven't signed a dotted line. (laughs) But that's just around the corner, March the 11th. So look out for that. Um, Then we are doing The Place Theatre. I've just come back from working with the Soweto Skeleton Movers in South Africa. Wow. Um, I was there for a couple of weeks in December. And and this crew is just sick. Um, I remember first seeing them on the street, mm. a place called Villa Kazi Street in Soweto. Okay. And their style is like enough bone breaking, these crazy hat tricks. And yeah, they're mad flexible. And yeah, they've got a beautiful story behind them. What's the name again? What's the name? Soweto Skeleton Movers. Google that. Yeah, definitely Google that. Um, And that's going to be at the Place Theatre on the 12th and the 13th of April. But yeah, this new show, they've been to London a couple of times. Um, I've toured around the world with them pretty much. America, um, we did Australia as part of the um, uh, Commonwealth Games in Melbourne was it Melbourne Gold Coast um, but yeah we done all over America as well and but this time we're doing a one hour long piece with them in which they do solos about things to do with life in Soweto yeah wow. and it's a real fun piece like we know them as doing very comedic stuff but this particular show they go a little bit dark you know what I mean really um I mean, basically, we did a we, we did a little sharing um, for the people that live nearby, and every one of them said, "Yep, that's life in Soweto." Oh, wow. Really responding to the current events, circumstances, the energy of what's going on yeah. on the street, ground level. Yeah, yeah, and it made me feel good because um, I didn't want to contribute to spreading lies. Mm about something, I mean, because I directed it, mm-hmm. but I really took from them the stories and their experiences, you know what I mean? Mm. So as joyous as it is, it gets dark sometimes. And it gets the message across. Ground level. Now, as I was waiting for John Z to, to come up the, the hill where the studio is, I saw on at least two occasions you getting stopped and we're talking to somebody. Is it? Yeah, dude. Like, I saw you I, I saw you from far and I was like, my guy is known. You're <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You're known. What's the day in the life of a John Z. D? I I mean, we've got all these creative things that you're thinking, but, you, you know, you tour in the world, theatre, hip-hop, mm. always seeing you at events. What's the, what's the science of your day? What, you know, where'd you get this... Wait, what, what's, what, just tell me your day. What, give me the structure. I try to stay in. I'm telling you that, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to lie, I do. I try to stay in because it does happen. You know mm-hmm. what I mean, I do walk out on the street and, you know, it's not like I'm that known. I'm not that famous, but sometimes it does feel like that. Mm-hmm. You know? well, you've but got a also, face that people know, you know. And, and, and I do like to talk to people. To be fair, I could, like, somebody could just be like that. And I'll be like, hey, what's up, man? Do, do I know you from somewhere? And, and I'll start talking to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I do like to stay in a lot because I've got a lot of work to do. Mm. Um, I do spend a bit too much time on my phone in this general position. Yeah, thumbs because down, yeah. I don't even use a laptop anymore. Yeah. I get everything done, even like writing copy for shows. I'm just here like that, you know, talking to the bloody thing. Yeah. It's, it's weird. There's this science of people saying, you know... These studies, they say, you know, get off your phone. Don't you know? Phone is 
everything. Like, you're not being rude. You're working. Like, yeah. that could be the next mill, for real. Yeah, it really can be. It really can be. And also, you know, I like getting on with shit. Do you get mm. what I'm saying? I like to, you know, shit, things need to be done. Boom, let me just do this, you know? Mm. Does it um, keep you evergreen? Is it? Is it? Because to me, it's like, You've, you've stayed incredibly consistent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. There's not one bit where it's like, no, there's no questioning. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the moral compass is definitely there. Mm -hmm. Does it keep you evergreen? Does it keep you on the ground? Um, I, I, I like getting on with stuff. And yes, I think that focusing on work keeps me level-headed or whatever. But yeah, I'm not interested in the celebrity side of it. I'm not interested in going to the latest parties at all. Mm -hmm. And as I get older, dude, mm -hmm. I do not give a shit <laughs> about socialising. Yeah. Oh, no, Sorry, no. guys. Dip, dip, Don't dive, get me wrong. So socialise, yeah. But no, I'm not interested. If anything, if it's if it's to do with work, I'm down. Do you know what I mean? So if I go to a dope art show or mm. whatever and we're talking cool, um, I'll tell you what, though. I did miss... Erica Badu. That's one concert I really wish I checked out. It's a regret, yeah. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, I am really looking to go to Flavor in a month. Um, that's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess there is a... How should we say? Yeah, it's just going back to the old days, the good old days, mm. and seeing all of the old crowd, you know? Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Again, the nostalgia is a nice, comfy place, but everyone's progressing as well. The The... the um, non-conforming mm. to a lot of people and I'm only speaking I guess there's a there's two sides to me all the time where you think to yourself well integrity is absolutely everything there'll be people out there listening now thinking wow like in 2023 moving forward mm. how do you retain your, how do you ret retain that integrity of keeping to your belief system of what creative output is mm. And not and avoiding not taking an L financially. Like, how mm. do you sustain? Mm. It's a tough one, isn't it? Well, <sighs> like the art isn't real. That's the real survival is survival. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's the real art, right? Honestly, good old arts council. Mm. You know, good old arts council. Good old Sadler's Wells. Mm. You know, um, I work for Sadler's Wells mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. Even though I've got a lot of freedom, fundamentally, um, I'm looked after by them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it allows me to not have to worry about that shit. And all I can do is focus on creativity. Big up Michel, the director of Breaking Convention, who does have to think about all that shit. Mm, mm. So you just want to say that it's been yes. looked after, yes, but yeah, yeah. not me. Or if she wouldn't be on the podcast, you understand. <laughs> Damn it, you know? Seriously, like, for me, I'm I'm so thankful that I've got a really good team around me mm. that's in which I'm able just to do what I'm good at, which is to develop creative projects mm. and, and, and try and... And, I guess, to influence and try to help people particularly young people because we are going to be opening the hip-hop theater academy nice. in sadler's world's new building wow late next year yeah um and this is another thing support is this yeah it's for kind of um actually i'm not supposed to say that so you didn't hear that <laughs> um but basically it's it's going to be accredited mm -hmm. and it's a two-year course for 16 and 19-year-olds. I guess it's kind of like a foundation course prior to going On hip-hop? On using the creative elements of hip-hop culture... As a tool. ...to make theatre. Yo, see what I'm saying? You don't fuck about around here on podcast. This is <laughs> proper shit. Like, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so so, so questions. The, the, the thing with a hip hop school that's yeah. a massive idea yeah. you know what I mean so I've kind of focused a bit more on how can we train in breaking popping rap and the focus of these things to, to then make theatre with it you know yeah, what I mean yeah, yeah. so um, yeah it is about technique I do want people to to learn and break down technique together 
within a peer-to-peer training structure, but with uh, focused teachers. So I'd like to be able to bring in different people who can workshop different ideas mm. in relation to breaking and popping specifically, and also hip hop dance, as in the social dance aspects of it. You know mm. what I mean? Um, and obviously have little offshoots of crump courses. You know what I mean? Brilliant. So yeah. I want to find a way of 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 having the roots of breaking and popping, but then have all of these other elements in there as well. But also the rap, do you know what I mean? I, I'm expecting all of the students to dance and to rap. Brilliant. So kind of like when you hear about a theatre school where people learn to sing and act and mm. dance, you know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. I want people to be rounded hip-hop performers in the true essence of the word hip-hop, not mm. just the dance, mm. not just the rap, not just the graffiti, mm. not just the music, but all of it. Have the tools that allow for you to express within the la- within the creative landscape of hip-hop. Yeah. Just think of different... I mean, that's what hip-hop was about, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, whether it be the breaks back in the day, you know, mm. from Black Sabbath to, uh, you know, the, to Bootsy, all these different, you know, Hendrix. And this wasn't hip-hop. You take these elements and yeah. you create, but you have to know them foundations. Yes, you have yes. to know what the breaks are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <sighs> I mean, it's it's really, it's quite a big idea. Um, and I think to focus it in on, on to produce theatre, to, to story tell. Mm. We're using these techniques to, for you to tell your story or for there to be an exercise and now you need to tell the story about the development of, um, I don't know, some kind of physics idea. Mm. But to present that, it needs to be presented in rhyme and using dance as the movement to express these things. Do you know what I mean? I'm just thinking, how can we use hip-hop to teach in many different ways, you know, creatively? Um. And, yeah, and the only way to do it is to try it, you know what I mean? Mm. There's a lot of questions I've got about these concepts, um, but the foundation is it's going to be very practically led, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to be talking too much talk, you know what I mean? I want them to get in the studio physically moving in the sorry, the recording studio as well as the dance studio, producing work. Mm. Um, that's another thing I really want to encourage, just making stuff and recording stuff. So each student has got a library, a digital library mm. of everything that they're making, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, yeah, rather than shun the digital world, how do we use that mm. to assist in the training of young people, you know? It's interesting because... There is that ever-pressing thing with technology. And I guess from a tutorial point of view, you know, giving people roadmaps isn't really... That doesn't that doesn't fuel a creative mind. Mm. You know, you're just giving them a rehashed version. Mm. Sometimes just to be that mentor and mm. just... You're here for a reason. We're here to do this reason. So what are you contributing? What, what can we influence? What can we steer? What can we, mm. you know, cultivate? Yes, 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 for sure. And... I mean, there's so much <clears throat> out there to work with. Uh, That's the, the, the thing that, that excites me. So so I do these professional development workshops. Um, the first one's called Open Art Surgery. <laughs> and for, for six days, we focus in on a group of six artists. So they could be solos or groups. And the plan is to create six minutes of work within one week and then present it at the end of the week to a Q&A, um, an, an audience that's open to Q&A. Awesome. Yeah. So obviously that sounds a bit scary because the artists have just made this work really quickly. Mm. But equally, um, I think humans are naturally understanding of these things and they're not going to yeah. crush your piece. So no, it's no, never no. happened, basically. No, no, no. Um, but there's always some really good conversation regarding the crowd having different views on what they've mm. seen the work do. But regardless, it's just great for the artist to be able to get this feedback, you know what I mean? And it's great for the audience as well. Like even people listening to this now, having a third party effect where, you know, if you've got a group of people that are listening to these theories and mm. talking about the creative thing you've done, 
the people in the audience will suddenly get this idea like, oh, wow, yeah, they, you know, I've got an idea. Yeah. It's almost like somewhere in the room, he's, you know, it's like your own internet yeah, <laughs> suddenly man. sending you information yes, that yes. is completely creative and designed to hit directly where you want to be. Yes, yes. yes. So good. And, and again, you know, <clears throat> the currency of that event really is the knowledge sharing. Do you mm. know what I mean? I think it's about audiences learning how to read dance, you know what I mean? Mm. On a very sophisticated level, do you know what I mean? Not mm. just, oh, the energy was nice, oh, that was a good move. But what is it as a language, do you know what I mean? How do, what do we understand about it? How you're perceiving it and what's it saying to you without... Yes. Without these words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I guess these are things that I've... I've I've learned from a theatrical perspective, studying at London Contemporary Dance School, um, but I'd like to think that I don't make it seem hoity-toity. No, I can't imagine. For a <laughs> I cannot. I mean, I don't know if anyone's getting the energy in here, but there, there definitely is no hoity-toit going on around here, mate. Yeah. <laughs> this is as raw as it comes. It's fantastic. Yeah. So this is really the. I mean, again, you, you're getting the idea. This is the playground of the mighty John Z D. And this is the future. This is the way it's looking for you right now. Mm. Does it ever, did you ever feel like, it, you know, I mean, the energy's coming from somewhere. It doesn't feel like it's ever going to stop, right? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, well, I'm the last of six kids. Um, and I always maintain that the energy comes from family members that have passed on. You know what I mean, um, my mum passed away, my dad passed away, two of my brothers passed away. Rest as well. in peace. Well, wow. okay. Um, but I think that, that I think their energy exists still and is with me all the time and I feel that I'm doing it with them. It's not even doing it for them. Mm. You know what I mean? um, so that is quite a motivating thing. Um, yeah, and just the people that I love that's around me now, my family, um, it's always a motivating feeling to... To have it's that. your reason. It's yeah. your, you should get up in the morning. Yeah. Fuck, I love that. See, yeah. it's everything, isn't it? Yeah, man. Roots. Yeah. What for and why? You know. And 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 it does. I feel that it kind of morally keeps me centered um, because I want the best for my my kids. Do you know what I mean? I mm. want to make sure that they see daddy and the best light that I can be, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, and it encourages one to be responsible, you know. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I do think that a lot, you know. Um, what do we look like to our young, you know? Yeah. Be they your children, be they your people you care for, mm -hmm. people you teach. Because I remember as a kid seeing some teachers that were straight up, Dickheads, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I will always remember them for that, mm. even though it was just one moment. It was enough. It was enough for it to just stay with you for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. you know. So I try to be conscious of that, mm. you know. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, in an equal measure, you can always remember the best teachers, but there are certain moments where you're just, you know, it 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 it, it, um, it questions your own moral compass to humanity at that mm. certain young age where you're just like what you no even that as a kid that doesn't make sense what do yeah. people do that shit for yeah you're right it's so important to um, send that message mm. oh that's so sick yeah man yeah yeah and so it's a huge responsibility the idea of this academy um and and it I am a little bit shaken in my boots, just a little bit. Um, but I think once we get started and we're in the flow of it, mm -hmm. it'll all make sense. You mm -hmm. know? But in my head, it, it just makes sense. I, I get it in my head. It's just about how to tra translate that to the people that need to tick boxes and mm. who's giving the money. Um, and yeah, and just for people to have faith in the process because... For me, it can't go wrong. No, you're you're the pilot. You're you're the captain of the ship, 
And if you've got the coordinates, you get, you know, you get to the dock. Mm. It's that simple, isn't it? Yeah. But again, it's, yeah, like you say, it's trying to articulate everything to, to the wire so that it's self-explanatory to even a, a six-year-old. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can ask a six-year-old and yeah. they'll tell you if you're doing it right or not because yeah. you've explained it. It's so, it's, yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. That's some science right there, right? right? right, right. <laughs> yeah. 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 How, how can you explain something to us? How can you explain some deep, meaningful shit to a six-year-old I think is important mm -hmm. you know because then your 40-year-olds will get it your 50-year-olds will get it mm -hmm. your 28-year-olds will get it yeah yeah and that's the future and and so many truths are just really simple anyway I mean obviously we can get into the myriad arguments which we are in we are in a time of arguing over meaningless it's bullshit bullshit um, and I think that rather than complicate everything and with just these attempts of trying to cancel people yeah, for just sure. for having a particular way of thinking that isn't mm. matching the zeitgeist or this digital zeitgeist which is being hacked mm. into our reality. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And for, we can't be led by that. Do no, you know it's, what I mean? it's calcifying. You, you lose all freedom of speech. You lose all creative desire, and mm. these opportunities suddenly become slimmer mm. because you're fighting against the tide. And you know it's divisive, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really, really horrible. It's really toxic in there. Yeah. But for me, you know, it's just in and out. You know what I mean, <laughs> it's a little in and out. Sometimes I might just talk some shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do, John Z, it's been a pleasure having you on. You're the most happiest camper on the planet. And it's just so good that you're still out doing your thing, my brother. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank it you so much stop. for coming on, bro. All good, man. All my good. God, my my God. pleasure. My pleasure, man. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all you're getting for now because we're going to do part twos and more. This, this man ain't going away anytime soon and I'll tell you something for nothing. The embodiment of street culture is right here, man. Killer Killer podcast, out like him was out of fashion, sharing his caring, you know what it do, all right? Crime don't pay, but neither do they. You know what I mean? Uh, don't talk to anyone, I would. And John Z, again, a pleasure. Big up, man. Oh, Big up, man. Out like him was out of fashion. Stay lucky, people. Peace. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. You are.